Welcome inside the parlor. Here I am in my new second strip, the Pro Edition. This is the first time in my life I've owned both the primary and secondary strip before the season's even kicked off. If you like it, and I'm an XL, fits like a glove, you can order from the link in the description below. So what's your level of excitement, anticipation, optimism? Because here in the parlor, I'm not going to lie, we're up to 11. And I do recall that this time last year, we had what appeared to be a pretty tidy preseason. And then opening day happened, and it would be a harbinger of things to come. But look at how far we have come in just a year's time. Later, I'll share my predicted lineup for the match at Newcastle, which is just right around the corner, as we present the Holy Trinity Show's predictions for the upcoming season. Now, I'm going to be chucking a bunch of very specific predictions at you during the course of this show, starting with an Aston Villa Hibernian playoff round tie in the Europa Conference League would be a glorious event. A John McGinn testimonial, basically. A wonderful away day for both sets of fans, with the added bonus of a potential Scotch whiskey tour. And as much as I admire and respect Luzerne, which is apparently a beautiful place, and the club has this ultra-modern and cool modular glue lamb stadium... I think we all should be hoping for the least amount of travel miles as possible this year. I'll share Villa's final table position prediction a little bit later on in the show, but I think we should probably talk about the three big issues that could prevent, say, a top six-ish finish. And the most obvious issue of them is injuries. I don't even like saying the word or putting it out in the universe, but the fact is it's the same for all clubs. Injuries can derail campaigns. And one of the most interesting facts surrounding Villa's incredible run-in that took them all the way to seventh at the end of last season was how few players they actually used during that time and how those players all managed to stay fit. We might have actually rode our luck a little bit there. The second thing that could impair upward movement from seventh is what all the other clubs around us are doing. Everybody in the top 10 seems to have lost somebody significant in their squad and have gained somebody who's promising, but you never know in the Premier League. Some clubs are tinkering. Others are stripping it right down to the studs like Chelsea under the guidance of Maurizio Pochettino. I mean, their renovation would make 24-7 proud. The wiring, the plumbing, it's all gone. How's that going to work? Are they going to improve? We'll talk about it more in specifics later, but Aston Villa didn't sit still this summer, and neither did most of the teams around us. And the third issue that could affect upward mobility in the Premier League table would be at least one successful cup run. And I see a lot of pundits and supporters alike already making Aston Villa either the favorites or crowning them champions of the Europa Conference League, given Una Emery's history in European competition and the state of our squad. And that's where I don't agree with comparisons to West Ham because I thought their recruitment was poor last summer, which left them in the bottom third of the table much of the year. And I think that's played out. Now, even in the final, which they won, I thought Fiorentina was the far better team on the day, but West Ham took their chances, which should tell us that this is not going to be a walk in the park or a straightforward run to the final. And if we do manage to get some success in the EFL or FA Cups, then perhaps the club will have to look at the fixtures and prioritize, you know, where do we put our resources here? Because obviously the goal is to win silverware. I've seen pundits from many other countries even say that Unai Emery's teams prioritize silverware over domestic table positions. And because his Sevilla and Villarreal teams were winning the Europa League, he was always qualifying for the Champions League anyway without the table position in the domestic league. Now, we know our owners want to be in the Champions League, and I think they want to get there via Premier League table position rather than hoping to win the Europa League one day. Emery said it himself, the priority in this project is the Premier League. And I think there's a big part of him 
for the reason why he took on this project was to prove that he could craft a campaign and get his team into those places in the most challenging league in the world. Here we go. Specific prediction number five. Aston Villa will once again be the most fouled team in the Premier League this coming season. Why is that important? Two very good reasons. Firstly, we spend a lot of time, resources, and technology even on innovating set-piece delivery and routines. So when we draw free kicks, especially ones in goal-scoring areas, we get a chance to exploit all that hard work done on the training ground. But there's another really important reason, and that is when you are fouled continuously in a game, you control the tempo of the game, or at least it helps you control the tempo of the game. You could slow things down. You decide when to restart. The minute Unai Emery walked through the doors of Villa, the first thing he said is, I want our team to control the game. The tempo, the terms, all of it. Earning fouls, as I said on the last show, is an art that is helped by good coaching. And I can't help but think that the additions of Musa Diaby and Yuri Tielemans will only help us earn more fouls and thus be able to maybe score for more free kicks. 28% of all goals, that's almost a third of Premier League goals, are scored via dead ball situations. Prediction number four. Aston Villa will play more cumulative minutes than any other Premier League club this coming season. Why is that and why should it matter, you wonder? As you may know, the Premier League and the EFL have changed how stoppage time is tabulated for the coming season. And this is being sold to us as, well, the fans are being shortchanged of actual football because of all the time wasting that occurs. Mm hmm. The cynic in me wonders if this is another arbitrary mechanism that the Premier League can use in order to get their big TV audience clubs to turn losses into draws or draws into wins in what will basically be the Sky 6 Fergie time. And when we as fans cannot see how that time is being tabulated, that's when we get suspicious. I watched Sunderland Ipswich the other day. 13 minutes of time was added on at the end of the game for, ironically, one of the biggest clubs outside of the Premier League to try to get a late equalizer, they ended up playing 15 minutes of stoppage time. I honestly believe behind the scenes, this competition adjustment is being called the Aston Villa rule because we were accused of time wasting every single week, usually by a losing manager. And I'll be curious to know whether our technical staff has to somehow address this because we cannot afford to play 105 minute games every single week. Will he ask Emmy Martinez to speed things up a little bit on restarts? Or is there another way from set pieces that we actually do play quickly when we're not in scoring positions? I don't know, but get used to it. I think we are going to end up hating fourth officials this season. Prediction number three, and this one will be critical in order for us to climb the table, but Aston Villa will significantly increase its goal difference in the coming season. How significantly? Well, we were at plus five. I think we're tripling it to plus 15. Think about it. Under Unai Emery, we were minus two at home to Liverpool, Arsenal, Leicester, and then minus two away to Manchester City. Just in those four games, that's minus eight. Now, do you think we're going to Newcastle and getting beaten 4-0 again this year? Or how about 3-0 away at Fulham or 2-0 at Bournemouth or 3-1 at Crystal Palace? I don't think so. It will start with us being much harder to score on at that end, and it will end with us tonking a few teams, which will happen this year. So I'm calling it a minimum of plus 15 in the goal difference this season. Specific prediction number two, Aston Villa is not yet done in the transfer market. I know we thought the same thing last year, got Carlos and Kamara done really early on, which has become a hallmark of our club. 
but then we never really added any more significant pieces after that. And this year feels different. First of all, we got the three must-haves through the door early, which was brilliant because now the club can clear out the peripheral, make some room money-wise, and if something comes around, they can pounce. And one of the things I love about Monchi, who actually came out recently and said Aston Villa is active, he knows the exact situation with almost every club in every league around the world because everybody tells them things. Agents tell them stuff. If there's a club that's up against it financially, he'll know whether there is a player that they might be able to wriggle away. Or if a player is unhappy, he'll know about it because an agent will probably tell him. I simply can't believe that we are done at this stage especially because we have so many bodies that have to be cleared out. And if we make some room and make some money, then I think there's still a significant incoming to be had. Here's a small but recent example, and I know Sevilla is Monchi's former club, so he'll be very dialed in with what's happening there. But their right back, Gonzalo Montiel, wants out. He's not happy. And he does have some legal problems in Argentina, which might be a bit of a red flag. But this is a player in his prime, on a good wage, 26 years of age, position of need, could either compete with or usurp Matty Cash. But more importantly, this is the clutch penalty taker we've been missing since Danny Ings left. This is the guy who scored the World Cup winning penalty for Argentina. And then 164 days later, he scores the Europa League clinching penalty for Sevilla. He's also won a Copa Libertadores with River Plate. He's a proven winner in his prime on a good ticket. Meanwhile, Manchi has other right backs on the line that he's probably leveraging against all the other clubs to ideally get the best player at the best deal. And I'm sure Emmy Martinez wouldn't mind having another Argentine World Cup winning teammate. Maybe keeps him around a little bit longer. There's been a lot of debate about Phil Coutinho because he's had a very lively and encouraging preseason. The problem with little Phil, though, is his wage bill. He's on a breathtaking ticket and he'll be 32 next June. And if your highest earner is not a guaranteed starter every single week, you've got a problem. Same could be said with Luca Dean, another very high earner. You clear those two guys out and all of a sudden you have a lot of financial flexibility while also wiping out all remaining traces of Steven Gerrard's time here at Aston Villa, but add some other names. Leander Dendonker, Bertrand Traore, Callum Chambers, maybe Leon Bailey. I mean, it adds up when you start moving these guys on, and that's why I still think there's a significant name to be coming in, and it's going to be a very interesting run-in to September 1st. Just before I get to Aston Villa's 2023-24 table position, I've got a bonus prediction just for you. This is going to be the season that you finally address, tackle, and go after that project you've been putting off for so long, that annoying thing you have to look at in the kitchen or living room or your place of work or recreational property for that matter. You're you're going to call up Paul Hansaker at 24-7 Services UK. I've put the numbers in the description down below. He's going to come over with a fair estimate, communicate clearly the timelines of your project, and then you are going to be so happy with the final product that you might call Paul back for other work. And as I speak, it's the man himself, Paul Hansaker, with his own prediction. Hi, Peter. My prediction for the Villa this year is top six. But I think we're going to win in Europe. And my number one prediction for the upcoming season, Aston Villa will finish fourth. Now, I want to back this up with some facts. And here's significant fact number one. Since Unai Emery arrived in the Premier League last year, only one team earned more points than Aston Villa, and that was Manchester City. Not Arsenal, not Manchester United, not Liverpool, Aston Villa. So here's the question. Could that same squad of players that ended up finishing seventh in the table, could they have added more points and higher table positions had they started the season with Unai Emery? I think they could have. Would have been difficult because it was a thin squad. But the fact is, We've upgraded our squad, in my opinion, significantly with three excellent signings that Unai Emery himself wanted to bring in and work with. So what happens 
when that upgraded squad, under the tutelage and guidance of Professor Unai, gets to start the Premier League season. Fact number two. Last year, we finished 10 points out of fourth place, a position occupied by this weekend's opponents, Newcastle United, who we battered at home in our best performance of the season by far. Now, no two seasons are the same, so we can't sit here and definitively say that 71 points will be enough for fourth place this season. It might take more points. It might take less. We don't know. But my question to you is, do you think we can make up those 10 points in the first part of this season, say from this weekend until the end of October, which would have been the Gerrard era last season? And I'm thinking specifically of Cherries away, Crystal Palace away, and West Ham at home. That's nine points right there. Now, it's also possible that we don't win some of the fixtures this year that we won last year. Like sweeping Spurs and Brighton was huge in us achieving seventh place. But I simply do not believe that Aston Villa is going to go backwards in the amount of points we earn this season. Now, on to something I alluded to earlier, and that's how the clubs around us are going about their business, which, of course, we have no control over, but will impact where we finish in the table, starting with Chelsea. I don't think there's any chance that Chelsea doesn't improve under Maurizio Pochettino, but that overhaul is so dramatic and it's so cultural, quite frankly. And that's his thing, cultural change, and he's going to need time. Could they jump three, four, five positions? Yes, this year. I don't think so. And I think he is going to be given the time. So eventually, Chelsea's going to be in that mix again. Manchester United have gone about their summer recruitment more strategically than I remember in past years where they went after big names. This year, it feels like they're going after the players that suit Eric Ten Hag's system. And I really respect and rate Manchester United's manager. And I can't see them slipping. I could see them staying the same or improving so they'll be in and around the top four and then there's arsenal it would have been very traumatic to have gone through what they went through at the end of last season i don't think there's any chance that that's going to happen again because they've learned from it they've lost granite jacka it was a pretty important voice in that dressing room but they've gained kai havertz declan rice others and maybe more still to come It'll be interesting if they could start the season the same way, because last year they rattled off five straight wins, including against us 2-1. Then they got jobbed at Old Trafford, I felt. Remember that foul that was called retroactively because they scored first? That was nullified, but they had a fantastic start. Are they able to start the season again? Are they capable of finishing first? They probably are. They'll definitely be a top four team. Manchester City lost two key contributors to their success this past season and before in Ilkay Gundogan and Riyad Mahrez. I mean, two clutch performers in both a plan A capacity or sometimes as plan B substitutes. And this is why I think they're trying so hard to keep Bernardo Silva around. They need some veteran glue guys in that club, even though on paper, the Gvardiol and Kovacic signings look pretty good. And although Manchester City is probably favored to win the title again, there is in professional sports this odd hangover effect that sometimes plagues those clubs who spent a lot of mental and physical energy and played a lot of games in winning, in this case, their first triple, and now they're going to be expected to do it all over again. Do they have the hunger to go and do it all over again? Liverpool. A club I've always respected and always will. Doesn't mean I like them or will support them, but I've respected them. And they have lost an astounding amount of leadership in this offseason. When you think about Milner, Henderson, Bobby Firmino, Fabinho, even Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, that is a lot of seasoned pros out the door all at once. They've brought in Alexis McAllister, good signing, Dominic Soboslai who is highly touted, the Hungarian midfielder. But something feels off and stale 
at Liverpool, if I'm reading things right. They would have been really disappointed with not getting Champions League football last year, especially because they're expanding Anfield for specifically those kinds of nights and occasions. So I'm wondering how willing the Fenway Sports Group is to keep giving Jurgen Klopp money because they could say, well, you know, Darwin Nunez didn't score as many goals as we thought. We also gave you Cody Gakpo. Get to the Champions League, Jurgen, and we'll talk. Then comes the club I believe will be in very close contention with, and of course this weekend's opponents, Newcastle United, who will have to manage both Premier League and Champions League football this season, which I think they can do. They have a lot of depth and good signings in Tenali and Harvey Barnes and others. We were a little bit behind them in their arc to rebuild, but now I feel as though we are very close and competitive clubs, and similar clubs for that matter. That's why this weekend's game is so big. Brighton and Hove Albion would be over the moon to finish sixth again, and they'll have to navigate European waters. But I do wonder, with McAllister and possibly Caicedo leaving, how long are they going to be able to replace those kinds of players all the time with new raw talent coming in and expecting them to deliver the way they have in the past. Brentford is a completely different proposition without Ivan Toney for long periods of time, and they've just lost their goalkeeper. And what can you say about Tottenham Hotspur under new management and a well-regarded manager too? How much of their season depends on Harry Kane's decision to either stay or move to Bayern Munich? And apparently we're going to get that decision before this weekend. And so I say fourth. But who cares what I think? The person we should be listening to is a man who has supported Aston Villa for 82 years. He was there in Rotterdam watching the European Cup get hoisted. None other than Paul Hansaker's dad, Ron. Ron is like... The chairman, the governor, the mayor, and the vicar all rolled into one with the voice of the maker. Ron, where is Villa finishing? Hi, Peter. I am extremely confident as a lifelong Villa supporter that we will finish number four in the Premier League. And there you have confirmation. Aston Villa will finish fourth. And I know, as Villa fans, we are wired to believe that we don't deserve the heady heights of fourth in the Premier League and that there is calamity around every corner and that just when things are looking rosy, the roof caves in. And we're not helped in our inferiority complex by recent relegation and then relegation survival, both traumatic. And of course, the media that treats us like the adorable little pet. Oh, there, there. Oh, Aston Villa, you're so adorable with your Spanish manager and your traditional stadium. Big club, big, big club. But let's get back to talking about Manchester United, please. Right, here's how I would start Aston Villa for opening weekend at Newcastle. And we're going to begin with the locked-in starters, the non-negotiables like Emmy Martinez, Tyrone Mings, Douglas Louise, the captain John McGinn, Ollie Watkins up front, and I believe Ezri Konza is a locked-in candidate for this game. If you're going to spend record money on a player like Musa Diaby, I think he has to start in a game like this, and I think the same can be said for Pau Torres. So the first big question is, who plays in midfield alongside Douglas Luiz? You can't really go wrong with Bubakar Kamara. He's had an excellent preseason. But with Harvey Barnes slated to bomb down Newcastle's left or right, wouldn't it make sense to have his former teammate Yuri Tielemans there to understand him and potentially help seal him off while also providing a statement by being in that lineup? Then who's going to start on the left-hand side? If you want to throw a wrinkle at Eddie Howe, you would start Jaden Philogene Bedes. He offers a lot athletically, but you also have to look at Emmy Buendia's preseason and say, how can you not start him in this game? And I like him on the sides with the ability to cut in. So then it's just a matter of, do you play Matty Cash against Harvey Barnes on the right there, or do you slide everybody over and start Luca Dean with a proper back four and him as a left back, which would also give you all three of your preferred set piece takers on the field at the same time in Dean, Buendia, and Louise. I believe this lineup here is capable of beating the Magpies on their home patch 
on opening day. Listen, I've watched an awful lot of football in my life, probably too much. I've been involved in teams that have gone on to win things and been behind the curtains to see why those groups function so effectively. I've never followed a side more closely than this Aston Villa side. And I know many pundits and fans don't believe we can improve on last year's finish. But I've seen enough evidence now that the players believe that they are about to have a great season. Calm in chaos is the biggest one, and confidence in their manager, a manager who is obsessive, compulsive on detail, and pushes them to be better every single day. So are you ready for a season that we may look back on as having been better than the Martin O'Neill era, maybe something that resembles early 90s Aston Villa in the inception of the Premier League. Because I am, and I am going to savor every last second of it. Up the mighty Villa.